from the shores of beautiful Lake Coeur d'Alene in the heart of North Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discuss their topics on our forum. The North Idaho College Public Forum. With your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our program today. We have a very important and serious topic to discuss with you. Our topic is dealing with a look at the Christian identity movement, a study of extreme racism. In order to address this topic, we've invited three guests to our program, all of them highly qualified to address uh, what is uh, in the interpretation of our guests, true Christianity versus an extreme doctrine that violates certain tenets of Christianity. I welcome to the program, first of all, Norm Gissel, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. Uh, Mr. Gissel has a very long history of working in civil rights law and uh, human rights organizations. He is the former president of the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations. Norm, you've been on the program before on a number of uh, of occasions. It's great to have you back. Thank you very much for inviting me once again. I'm equally pleased to also invite uh, uh, Father Roger Lachance, uh, who is the pastor of St. Pius X Catholic Church in Coeur d'Alene, and Father Lachance has worked with us on a number of occasions in our work and in our lecture series. And uh, Father, I'd like to say to you that last year when you, in our Chautauqua performance, performed as uh, Pope John the Twenty-Third, I was moved by your presentation. It was excellent. Thank you for being here tonight. And I'm equally pleased to also invite to the program Reverend Mike Bullard. He is the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Coeur d'Alene. And Reverend Bullard and I have worked on a number of occasions and activities. He's also a former board member of the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations. Welcome to our program. We're so pleased to have you here. Thank you. And as we're moving into our new year, I'm so pleased to have both of our regular panelists back. Uh, first of all, it's Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. And uh, Janelle, you're starting either your 24th or 25th year with us on the program. I believe it's number 25. It's a pleasure to be here, Tony. It's great to have you here, and equally pleased to have Steve Schink, who is the Vice President of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College, and Janelle com- will commence today's questioning. Uh, my first question is for Mr. Gissel. Will you please define for us what is meant by the Christian identity movement? Um, I'd, I'd like to do so, and I'd like to start off with prefacing this, that I'm going to address it essentially in a secular and a political way. The, the religious experts, I'm going to defer to them in a more intimate religious context of what that means. Christian identity came to the United States sometime after the 19 or 1880s. It uh, was popularized by a book written in England and came out at about the time that Darwin's or- Origin of Species came out and was the more popular book in England, by the way. Um, Uh, And it indicated and it tried to explain why the British people were so wonderful at that point in history. I mean, if you looked at the world in the 1830s, the um, British were a pretty successful people. They had uh, areas entirely encompassing the globe that they had controlled and and they thought themselves a pretty magnificent group of people. And, and there's some among them that wanted to have a biblical explanation of how wonderful they were. And they fashioned onto the idea that wherever in the Bible you found the word Israelites, what you were essentially talking about were the British people. And that um, this helped explain to the British people why they were so wonderful. As their uh, international success uh, decline through World War I and again in World War II, uh, it became a less popular aspect of the religious beliefs of the British people and was swiftly imported uh, to the United States and it has taken on this idea of Christian identity. But it really hasn't changed any. What it essentially says is that wherever you read the word Israelite in the Old Testament, the New Testament, wherever you would find it, that you're to supplant the words white people and that that gives some in political enlightenment and some religious enlightenment and, and, and a new and fresh, according to their beliefs, interpretation of the Bible. How that use has been put in the United States is a particularly negative one. And uh, again, there's a huge amount of national suffering is caused by this weird and bizarre interpretation of biblical uh, passages. 
It has also come to us in a different fashion, and it's interesting, and I'll just conclude it very shortly. The Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s was, was at the heights of its influence, and many, many Protestant churches and many, many Protestant ministers subscribed to the Klan beliefs until it became apparent to everybody how violent and vicious the Klan was, and there was a drawing away from the Klan of, of the religious uh, stalwarts in the various communities where they were popular, and particularly the, the Protestant ministers. And the lesson that uh, was learned there was that, from the Klan's point of view, is that you cannot afford politically to have a religion withdraw from you. So rather than have that happen, what essentially is that they've created their own religion, and it is a racist religion. And so if you create your own religion, your religious leaders will never abandon you because you are your own religious leaders. And so we kind of have it from two points of view how this, how this Christian identity movement has come to us in the 1990s. Steve Sheen. Um, let me follow up just a little bit about some of the, of the history of the, uh, uh, of the Christian identity movement, and then maybe we can move to the, the religious theme. Uh, uh, Norm, uh, you say that the, that the Klan was central to the spread of the Christian identity movement in this country. Is that correct? No. What I'm trying to say is that the, that the Protestant, religion, Protestant religious leaders were central to the spread of the Klan in the 20s, in the 1920s in America. And as they withdrew their support, I see. the Klan atrophied. And the historical lesson to racist was create your own religion because these Protestants were, are going to leave you it, 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 when you start uh, killing people. And that's a very awkward uh, situation to have. And the Klan, it was very, religion was very important to the Klan of the 20s, it was very important. And it was a great and grievous blow to them when the Protestant ministry started uh, withdrawing from the, the active Klan participation. In its present form, uh, in the Northwest and in, and in uh, the country uh, today, about how many members does the Christian identity movement claim? Well, there are many, many little, tiny, isolated Christian identity churches throughout America. And many are not of uh, this particular vicious group that we have here locally, uh, and, uh, and they're just, you know, they're uh, like Branch Davidians, essentially harmless people that gather to themselves and, and have whatever quaint beliefs they might uh, enjoy and practice. It is when you take this belief system that is anti-ethical to the religious teachings uh, of the mainstream uh, religious uh, entities in the United States and turn that against African Americans and Jews and other minorities is when it becomes so vicious and, and uh, s such a terrible plague on American society. Might be a very good point for me to shift uh, before I turn the question over to do one, one thing, if you don't Certainly. mind? I think for our viewers are not aware of this, you might have, uh, Norm, if you would, just take it one step further so that the ministers and, uh, and priests can respond. That is, when you say it is racist and all, what do they say about the non-whites, such as well, the, the African Americans, or also the Jewish community? Yeah. Where do they say they well, came from? Is, That's at the heart of their okay. doctrine. This is a family show, so I'll, I'll, yes. I'll gild a little bit here. Yeah. Uh, essentially, that they regard um, anybody of color as the mud races. They believe that there's two interpretations of the, the creation of man in the Bible, and there's one, the, and the one of those creations talks about man from clay. And they would regard all the colored people uh, in America and, and elsewhere in the world as part of this mud race. That they've evolved essentially from mud. Uh, that's their issue. Then the Jews arrived through uh, satanic means, and that Eve uh, bore the child of Satan, and that uh, genetically all Jews are uh, carry the seed of the devil. Uh, so what what? What you're saying is that the Christian identity movement is very anti-Semitic, yeah. and it's racist. Absolutely. And, and there, Steve, if we can, from that bridge, take well, it and, to the... And I was going in a similar direction yeah. anyway, but th this will give me some point to clarify. I, I was watching public television not too long ago, and there was an excellent program on about, about the tribulation, about the apocalypse, and about the second coming of Christ. And there was a slightly different version uh, presented there, a Norm, that, that people of color were, uh, were too... Um, 
and I didn't realize that they, they were talking about the Christian identity movement, but, but certainly to those racists who, who claim Christianity as some, as some part of their belief system, that to them they are like the beasts of the field. Is that, a, is that something that, that you have also heard or um, different entirely? That's a, I'll, I'll turn that over to the religious experts here as to the biblical interpretation of that. And a broader question, and this is probably where I was going to go first, is are there any biblical underpinnings, whatever? Is this just a perversion that has no basis in, in, in anything biblical? Uh, or are there some, uh, some biblical underpinnings that, they, that they've twisted to, to, uh, to get to, to this racist perspective? You hear a lot of quotes and a lot of one-liners and a lot of very strange interpretations of parts of the Bible. Um, the, um, so there are things that they, that they say are biblical based on their, their interpretation of, of parts of the Bible. Uh, though uh, to, to most of the people who study the Bible around the world over these centuries, it uh, would be very antithetical to the, to the biblical message. I think that the dignity of the human person, of course, is rooted um, in the fact that he's created in the image and likeness of God, he or she. You know, Scripture doesn't say anything about color here. You know, uh, in the creation account, it's the human family. It's created in the image and likeness of God. And the human family is not just good, it's very good, as we read in Scripture. And so therefore, for a person to, say, to pick and choose and say, well, this person, that color, that ethnic background isn't good, isn't created in the image and likeness of God, I think you'd be hard pressed to prove that. It's not in the scriptures. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Steve. That was, that was very helpful. I want to talk to our two religious leaders also. Uh, in my understanding of theology and, and the basis of other religions, I certainly don't want to uh, fail to recognize the, the many religions of the world, but since you both represent the Christian community uh, and certainly what we would describe as the great majority of opinion within the Christian community or the mainstream Christianity, uh, it is my understanding that Christianity is based on love. And I want to get you to respond to that, but with the, the preface to say that the Christian identity movement is certainly not based on love in the doctrine that Norm Gissel just shared with us. So would you take both of you, um, Reverend Buller, maybe we'll start with you, uh, and talk to us about uh, your interpretation of the tenets of Christianity and, and what Father Lachance just said. What is this contrast of, of uh, the meaning Christianity versus the Christian identity movement. Well, you know, when you say your understanding of Christianity is, is that it, is that it uh, revolves around love, that's certainly the case. But I think it's important to say that it's not a love that feels good, that's the popular in thing, it sounds nice and so on. It's a commandment to love. It's an obligation that is really not an easy thing that goes, that goes beyond. Jesus says, says, as you've done it to one of the least of these, my sisters and brothers, you've done it to me. And so it really carries a very strong uh, moral imperative uh, to love and to love those whom others don't love. And so, uh, um, and I think you would find that pretty broadly recognized against the, against the Christian community. I was, I think it's important for the Christian community as such to respond to some of these claims because the Christian identity movement claims to be Christian. And I think that it's very important for those that have a different vision of Christianity to say so. Um, there was uh, a gathering uh, in which some of the churches wanted to learn about the Christian identity movement. And uh, at that gathering, a number of people signed a statement, this statement that was available. Was that, was that St. Pius, yeah. that's your church? Mm -hmm says, uh, we believe that every human being is created in God's image, as, as Father Roger said, that God's love is freely offered to every person, and that it is contradictory to biblical belief to use the name of Jesus Christ to advocate either racial superiority or the deliberate mistreatment of any person. Now, that declaration was signed at that event by Catholic, Mainline Protestant, that's a Lutheran, Methodist, Episcopalian, uh, Baptist. You had uh, non-denominational and independent churches signing that. You had uh, uh, a couple of very fundamentalist churches. 
You had uh, folks there, I think, from the Nazarene Church. You had the, uh, also you had groups, you had the Seventh-day Adventists and, and uh, Unity. Unity, the um, LDS, a very wide agreement in that particular statement. Um, and I think that's, that indicates uh, the, um, the level at which, which the church presents a very different and very uh, opposite message. Thank you. Probably. Thank you. The, of course, the gospel is based on love. And uh, as uh, Pastor Mike said, that um, the commandment of Jesus is simply that we love. If you truly want to be a successful Christian, you truly love God, and you truly love those made in the image and likeness of God. And uh, there's sort of a, a litmus test, if, you, if I may use the word, in Scripture. Um, By their fruits you shall know them. And the fruits of the Spirit are charity, joy, peace, patience, goodness. I don't think God works against himself. If a person can say, well, I'm representing God, and then I'm and acting in, in direct contradiction to the teachings of, of, of Jesus, uh, to the teachings of, of, of Almighty God, flags should be all over the place. Uh, so I would think that, you know, as we look at ourselves, if we are truly our Christian people, uh, if we truly bear the name Christ, what does that mean? If we are Christed, if we are carrying Christ to the world, what does that mean? Then our actions, as Paul tells us, you know, put on Christ. What does that mean? That our speech, our attitudes, our, our love, our care, have got to uh, manifest to the world the picture of Jesus. If not, you may call yourself Christian till the cows come home. You, you know, it's a lie. Oh, sure, we sometimes fall far from what we should be, but I think even if people far fall from what they know they ought to be as Christian people, there's, there's that continual uh, effort to become more and more what the Lord calls them to be, to keep working through their, 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 their pitfalls, their, their sinfulness, their, their selfishness, and to become truly a loving people. If we stop doing that, then I think, as I say, you can call yourself Christian, but question mark, question mark, question mark. Thank you. Danielle Burke. My question is for all three of you, actually, but let's start with Father Roger. Is there a way you can recognize Christian identity if someone is approaching you or you're getting some information? Is there a way you can recognize that that's not what you should be listening to or should be adhering to? I think at first, you know, sometimes stuff comes out very slick, yes. very slick and very inviting. But as you as the pres presentation is more and more extended, expanded and extended, I think basically you ask yourself a couple of questions. Is this a loving way to respond? Is it truly a human way to respond? Is it a responsible way to respond? Is this how I think Jesus would respond? There's a very popular uh, little device that's being given out these days, WWJD. What would Jesus do? In a sort of, in maybe one sense, a sort of pop, pop morality, but there's some real good insights into it. What would Jesus do? And I think, uh, Mike, maybe you have some comment. You know? Well, that goes back to what you said about by the fruits you shall know them. Sure. The Presbyterian uh, branch of the of the Christian uh, family has a very strong statement that truth is in order to goodness. That is, the test of any doctrine is is by what it results in terms of how people act and how people treat people and, and uh, you know, how it bears fruit in their life. Norm, what about some practical ad advice as well uh, in terms of how you might recognize it by, by any kind of uh, symbol or anything like that that's on in the information? Well, the, 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 what, I, what I do when I'm reading literature that's been given to me and that's been handed out or something that somebody wants to know the source of this, um, I examine it uh, for its uh, racist qualities. It's very difficult for the Aryan nations or any other of these uh, groups of people to, uh, to discuss anything for very long without getting to their core level of cultural anger, and that's against uh, people of color or Jews or something of that, uh, that nature. And that shows up in that literature very quickly. And it, and it, or it'll come to you in a very flattering way to a, to a young white man to uh, say to this young white man that 
that, that Jesus favors you over everybody else to the exclusion of, of these targeted groups, the area, the African Americans, the uh, Chinese Americans, or the Jews, or what have you. And that from a political point of view and from a cultural point of view, what they're trying to get to is that this area nation belief system has something particular to offer to you and that you've been sold a bill of goods about the universal love of God. It isn't universal, it's strictly associated with white people. And that can be, a, unfortunately, and apparently a very attractive uh, point of view uh, among a limited number of Americans. Steve Ching. Norm, there's a, there is a, there's too much racism, excuse me, there's too much uh, um, prejudice in America and we're gonna be a long time eradicating that. Uh, there's less racism, uh, and I think much of that, I if you were to confront someone, uh, they would probably uh, um, and probably believe it when they said it. Say, oh, I'm not a racist. Yeah. Uh, but uh, as you say, if you got to some of their core beliefs, I think you could make a strong case for the fact that they are. There's a much, much smaller group, thankfully, of what I would call active racists in America, people who, who actively preach right. and, and then act on uh, that doctrine of hate. How closely are those racists and the Christian identity movement linked? Uh, that's, an that's kind of the $64 question that we're currently dealing with here in the, the Northwest and elsewhere in the United States. I think it's going to come down just the way the Klan did in the 20s. Uh, I think when people are confronted with the hostile, terrifying criminal activity of a Buford furrow, mm -hmm. and to understand that he probably was not a madman. What he was doing was acting out a mad religion. And that when they see that his racist beliefs propelled him to do these things, and that they share in some minor way or in some significant way his beliefs, that they will be repelled from that and that they'll seek guidance from their own ministers and their own priests, such as these fine gentlemen we have here, and that they will discuss their racist beliefs and that they will understand that, uh, that the essential core issue of the Christian religion is a universal love and is not a particular love. I think we'd be surprised, you know, when, please God, when we're all standing before the Lord in heaven and see, you see people of every race, culture, and nation up there. And say, Oh, I think we'd be, be surprised. Well, maybe we shouldn't be because, as you mentioned, Norm, God's universal love, that God loves all. And Je that Jesus, we believe as Christian people, believe that Jesus is Savior of all, not just some, Savior of all. It doesn't say, for God so loved part of the world. It says, <laughs> for God so loved the world. Yeah. Uh, a somewhat related question. Um, what has been the response of the Christian identity movement to your resolution and, and, and to the very extreme difference that you've, you've given us today between your view of Christianity and theirs. Anything overt at all? Haven't heard any response uh, directly. Uh, yeah. And we might note that some of the uh, Christian identity people were present at this forum mm -hmm. and uh, they knew what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was some, I'm sure they were not very well pleased with it, but that's tough. They were offering uh, you know, their ideas and their arguments but it really was not uh, set up as a debate type of thing, and we really didn't want to, to get, in, get into that, uh, that kind of a thing. I just uh, realized that something I wanted to say a moment ago when I talked about this joint declaration. When I gave that list of all the, the different faiths and the different flavors of, of faith, um, I cannot think of anything else in the world that we could get people from all those different religious viewpoints to sign one document and to agree. Uh, I think that's, uh, that shows a high level of agreement. My question is to follow up on Steve's, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, first of all, uh, it is very obvious from what you have said, uh, Reverend Bullard, that uh, the many different uh, members of the religious community in this area certainly came forth, took a stand, uh, and you certainly have taken a stand here with your comments, and civil rights groups like that Norm Gilson involved in have done so. Would you take a moment to talk about uh, the responsibility of, in your case, the Christian community, and certainly there are other religious communities, the Jewish community, and, and uh, uh, other religions that 
certainly do stand up and speak out on the, these questions. So how important is it for the, when, when something comes under the heading to try to suggest that they are part of the religious community, is there anyone has more responsibility than what we are talking about here in that, your religious community to come out and, and take a stand? You've certainly have done that. And yeah. I, I, I think it's absolutely imperative that people say what Christianity is and not let uh, one group uh, say, this is Christianity, this is Christian. Uh, and um, I think uh, particularly as you look at the Second World War and the things that were going on in Germany, what, what I'm very sad was missing was a, a little louder Christian voice that right. some of these things are wrong. And I think it's, it's important that we do that. And at our um, uh, meeting that the, that the, at the Father Rogers Church, um, we specifically said this is a, a Christian viewpoint not meaning that others couldn't join in that. I mean, it's important that other people of other faiths agree and want to say that, sure. and we certainly are glad that they agree with it. But since, since Christian words are being used, it's very important that we know what it is we believe, that we have a strong biblical base, and that we have studied and, and are prepared to speak our belief. Isn't it also important, and I'll ask this to Father Roger, uh, isn't it very important for the Jewish community to hear from the Christian community that is, that the Christian community condemns this anti-Semitic doctrine. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, e e even so much so that, you know, uh, Christians say, well, you can't see Jesus as Lord unless you acknowledge the, the fatherhood of God. And fatherhood of God for whom? For everyone. Because again, we're all made in the image and likeness of God. And, and if, we, if we say that's not the case, then, then we're, not, we're not Christians. Norm, we're just about time, maybe in 20 or 30 seconds. What's the role of civil rights groups in this situation? Well, the, the role of civil rights groups in this situation is to um, meet definitively um, the underlying racism that is so, uh, that is just boiling below the surface of the Christian identity movement and to reveal it for what it is. On that note, I have to bring the program conclusion. On behalf of Janelle Burt, and Steve Schink and our staff. I deeply think all three of you, you've been most informative and it's been a very, very important discussion. Uh, and I commend all three of you for being so clear in your statements about uh, this issue. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you have found this program very informative. That was our intent. And I'd like to invite you to be with us again next week at the same time when we shall move to another subject. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum is the longest running public television show of its type in North America and is seen in seven states and two Canadian provinces. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational community outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another new edition of North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.